Hi Year 9, the um, next three lessons of this topic B2 are going to be looking at limiting factors, the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Now um, this is lesson two of um, the topic and we are going to look at how light affects the rate of photosynthesis today. Um, we're going to collect some data, we're going to draw a graph and then make some conclusions. Okay, so a limiting factor is one, if one of the factors is restricted or limited, the rate of photosynthesis will be below the maximum possible rate. So it's about trying to find the best conditions to get the best rate of photosynthesis, therefore the best growth and make the most money for um, farmers, okay? So farmers growing plants. So that's just getting us thinking, those are the factors that we're going to investigate. And here is today's title. Okay, so this title will work now for the next three lessons. Okay, maybe you could do a subtitle um, or subheading saying uh, investigating light. So how do limiting factors affect the rate of photosynthesis? Write down the date and write down that title. Make sure we're in our biology book, please. And if you want to do a subheading that says uh, investigating light, because that's the one that we're looking at today, then that is perfectly fine. Okay. So there are two ways that we could measure the rate of photosynthesis. Both of them involve collecting oxygen because we know that oxygen is produced as a result of photosynthesis by plants. We've chosen to use a pondweed because it lives underwater and then we're able to collect the oxygen from it. Now we're going to be using the method on the right. The method on the left quite often comes up in exam questions as well as the one on the right and it is purely counting oxygen bubbles. So you might decide that for 30 seconds you're going to count the number of oxygen bubbles that come off of the pondweed in different conditions. So we've got the lamp on the left hand side there, um, we're looking at distance the lamp is from the pondweed and then we've got this upturned boiling tube with um, filled with water and as the bubbles come off of the pondweed, we can count those bubbles. We might have some kind of clicking system um, that counts for us um, so that we can see how many bubbles are produced in a fixed period of time. It might only be something as simple as 30 seconds or a minute, okay? And then we change our condition. In today's case, it's the light intensity and um, we can measure again. Now it's really important that when we set a new light intensity, we allow the pondweed, the plant, to um, acclimatise to that new condition. So we might leave it in that new condition for quite a while, just so that it can get used to the new rate of photosynthesis. Otherwise our results are not valid. The method we're looking at today is involving the picture on the right, where we've got this syringe, um, which is collecting the oxygen. Um, and we'll collect that oxygen over, um, a, again, a fixed period of time, but probably a longer time, maybe 10 minutes. You won't want to count bubbles for 10 minutes, but the longer you leave it for, the more valid the results are going to be. So we're going to leave that for uh, 10 minutes and see how much oxygen has been produced in that time. Now you can see that on the right hand picture there we've got the pondweed in a boiling tube and then we've got that boiling tube inside a beaker of water. And what that does is it reduces any temperature increase in the um, boiling tube where the pondweed is because that lamp is going to heat up the water. So if we just had the boiling tube without the beaker, then it would get hotter. And then we've changed the um, independent variable of temperature as well as light intensity. So that's why that beaker is there to control the temperature of the pondweed. So two methods of, of um, achieving this, um, we're going to use the method on the right. Any exam question may choose either of those methods. Okay, if you wanna put some details about how the method's going to take place, or maybe a diagram of the equipment, then that is absolutely fine. In a few lessons time, we're gonna look at a six marker, so we'll bring those ideas together then. 
Okay, so we are measuring the light intensity either by measuring the distance in centimetres between the lamp and the pond weed, or we could use a light meter, which is how we're going to do our results today, um, looking at the light intensity measured in lux or lumens using a light meter. Okay, so the, uh, this part of the light meter here is um, put in front of the light where the pond weed is, and it will tell you the light intensity, and then you can move the lamp um, in accordance to get the light intensity that you're looking for. Okay, so there's two ways of measuring the light using distance of the lamp between the pond weed, uh, to the pond weed, and um, looking at the light intensity. Okay, if we can get a note on that, please. If you need to pause, pause now. And this is what the experiment's gonna look like. So we've got lots of things we can vary. As I said, to monitor the rate of photosynthesis, we are going to measure how much oxygen is produced in a given time, okay? So that's gonna be our indicator of the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to draw into our books, please, this um, results table. Okay, and now I'm not just gonna sit and wait for you to do that. I'm gonna pull that back because it's not got the bottom line. There it is. Um, I'm going to uh, say to you to pause it and then we'll get on with collecting those results. Okay, so to draw your results table, pause now. Okay, so here is the model simulation. As you can see, we can change lots of things, distance to the light, we get more bubbles here, we can change the temperature, we can change the um, amount of carbonate that goes into it, which will affect the amount of carbon dioxide um, given to the pond weed. We can change the time and we can actually get um, multiple sets of readings. We can click repeat reading and we will get a different reading each time. Uh, we might be identifying some anomalies, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna collect the results. I appreciate that's quite tedious. Once you get into the role of things, you might decide just to skip forward and get the um, the results table which I will put up after I've collected the results. So I'm going to start off with um, the light meter reading on 10 lux. There it is. And then I tap here to get my bubble of oxygen. And that I'm going to say is 1.5. So I'm, I've made my own results table and I'm going to do a repeat reading now. Slightly less, but still 1.5. And third repeat reading, slightly less, 1.4. No anomalies there, no anomalous results. Okay, so when we come to do our mean, we can just add those three up and then divide by three. I'm gonna start off doing some of the means for you and then you're going to do the others later on. Okay, so let's um, tap that back in take this to 20 lux and then tap out again and we've got 2.2 repeat reading 2.4 repeat reading 2.6 no anomalies there let's go to 30 lux and tap 3.2, 2.6, and 2.8. Although we've got a wide range there, I'm still going to say none of those are anomalies because all of those values are higher than the values were at 20 lux. Okay. Three point one, three point three, and four point two. Quite a wide range there. You might consider that four point two to be an anomaly, and we'll look at that later. Fifty lux. 
Zero, always to one decimal place. 3.0. I'm going to circle that because I see that is an anomaly. So I'm going to circle my 3.0 in my table. And let's take this to 60 lux and go again. Strange result again. So we've got 3.2. Four point zero and three point one. Strange results. Okay, let's keep going before we talk too much more about anomalies. So we're going to seventy now. Okay, we're getting a trend here. Three point two. Three point three and four point three. And let's go to eighty. Oops, what's one we're not doing? Oh. There we go. Four point three. 3.7 let's go to put that just in place for 90 and tap 3.7 3.0 making me question whether I should have said that 3.0 on 50 lux was anomalous to be honest because we've got those threes cropping up quite a lot in these recent results okay so we might take that one out and let's go to 100 lux 3.3, uh, 3.2, 3.6, and that's all of our results collected. Okay, so we'll put those results into our results table. Um, we'll have a look at how we, how we calculate our means, and then we'll look at what we're going to do with that data afterwards. Okay, so we've just collected our results and I've put all of those results into the table. So if you missed any or you didn't want to watch me go through and collect all the results, which is fine, um, I've put them into the table here. So I've calculated the two means for you. Notice that I have kept my means to one decimal place. All of our results to one decimal place, therefore our mean should be to one decimal place. And as I talked about at the time, was finding it hard to identify those anomalies. Uh, you could identify anomalies if you'd like to. If you want to call this 4.2 here um, an anomaly because it doesn't fit the pattern of the others, that is perfectly okay. Um, other than that, um, I'm just looking now. I don't think we're going to call any of the others anomalies. Okay, we'll call that one anom an anomaly so that we are able to see what we do with that data um, later on. Okay, I'm now going to show you how to draw a graph. Um, I'm going to use Excel because I haven't got any graph paper to hand. If you want to use Excel, that's fine. If you just want to try in your book or if you have got any graph paper, any of those options are perfectly fine. Okay, so we're going to pause now to get all of our means done and then we're going to use Excel to draw some graphs, okay, which is up to you. That's just the way I'm going to do it so that you can see what your graph should look like. Okay, so to get all of your results sorted into your table and to calculate your means, pause now. Okay, as you can see, I've put all of my results to it into Excel. I can see here that some of my decimal places have gone, so I'm just going to click over here 
and that should take everything, oh, wrong way, should take everything to one decimal place, okay? And that's how I wanted my results to be because that's how they were in the beginning. And what I've done is I've put in my two means that I'd calculated on my calculator. Over here, I have put in a calculation. So I've put equal sum, open bracket, B6, um, colon, D6, close bracket, divide by three. And that's given me a mean of these three results here, okay? So what I've done with that is I've managed to get a mean. I've used the same feature up here in order to um, get them all to one decimal place so that all my results look exactly the same. We identified that this one here might be an anomaly. Okay, so I'm going to take that one out. And then for this one, so I don't include that in the um, uh, mean, I'm going to change that from D7 to C7. So I'll just calculate the two there. And then I'm going to divide that by two. And that is my mean of just those two results there. Okay, so I get a mean of 3.2. And that is quite common in the exam where we identify a result that doesn't fit the pattern and then we just do the mean divided by two because we've got two results. All of those means, get your green pen, do some checking, they should all be similar to the original results. If you've got a number that's much, much too big, then probably you haven't done your divide, you've just um, totaled them up and not divided it, okay? So what I've done is I have um, worked out all of the means, I've checked them, yes I'm happy with them, they look similar to the original results and now I can go ahead and I can plot my results, okay. Now I have got further up here, can't quite see it, I've got my information there, okay. So I'm going to, I might have to play around with this, in fact I'm going to do this differently, I haven't used Excel for a while so bear with me. I'm going to take this column here, I'm not interested in all my repeats, I'm just interested in my mean. So I'm now going to press control and then I'm going to take my means and then I'm going to go to, uh, I've clicked on, bear with me. Okay, so I'm on insert and I've got all of my different charts and graphs up here and I want a scatter graph that I can then put a line to. Okay, so I'm going to have a look at what we've got available. That one probably, see that you can actually look at them beforehand, that probably looks like the best one. I'm probably not going to be able to get a line of best fit on this graph, if you know how to, let me know. Um, but it's certainly going to give me a good pattern. Maybe then I can print it um, and then I can um, draw a line of best fit over the top of the results. OK, so we've got one there, which is a line, but still not. I'm going to keep my points. I'm going to click OK. And there is my graph. And then if I go into format, no, still in graph. I think I can choose different options on this top bar that will give me, just play around with that I suppose if you want, at least you can see the pattern of results I was expecting. Um, I'm looking to try to add, ah, add, um, just in this top corner over here, add chart element, okay, so, I'm doing it real time with you, so I'm just playing around with it. It's been a while since I have done anything like this, so I thought, well, I'll give it a go, see what happens. Uh, so axis title, we're going to do the horizontal axis. There it is. And that was our light intensity in Lux. Okay. And then go back to the same bit. Title vertical axis and that was um, let's be specific okay so it was length of oxygen bubble produced in 10 mems and that length 
and the length of the oxygen bubble was measured in centimetres. Okay, so I've now got some bits and pieces on there. Fonda chart title, I can, I don't fancy it today. Um, I've now got my pattern of results, so now I can make some conclusions from it. Okay, so what's really important here is that I can take that graph and I can see that as light intensity increases, so does the amount of oxygen produced. Therefore, um, I can say the rate of photosynthesis increase, increases. So as light intensity increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis. And then we get to this bit, if we kind of ignore these two points here and say they're anomalies because they're not really fit in a pattern, we can see that this tails off, it's curving off like this, okay? That means that we can say that as you increase the light intensity beyond, say, 50 um, lux, which was what I decided was my optimum, um, it doesn't really make any difference how much more light you give it, but it will cost you more money if you've got a dimmer switch and you're turning those lights on uh, to give more light intensity. It's going to cost more money, but it's not actually going to benefit the plants. They're not going to photosynthesize at a greater rate. So we would say that here is our optimum uh, value of light intensity. Okay, So that is what's really important to get from this. Okay, We'll have some time now to make sure that our graphs are drawn we've got something in our book okay now it might be that you use excel and you print it and then you put that into your book it might be that you use graph paper it might be that you take a picture of the screen and you put that in your book i really don't mind as long as we've got some kind of graph in our book for these results Okay, so the final part of this lesson then is to look at some data analysis. What does this graph really show us? And I started to talk about that. So we collected our data and plotted our graph. We've identified the independent variable this time is the light intensity in lux, and that's always on the bottom of our graph. We've identified that the dependent variable is the length of oxygen bubble produced in 10 minutes, um, and that was measured in centimetres. The relationship at the start is that as light intensity increases, so does the amount of oxygen produced and therefore the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, let's get some notes on this, please. Explain what the graph shows. It shows, and I just talked about it, that as you increase that light intensity further, it makes no difference to the rate of photosynthesis. So it's in fact wasted money to give the plants more light if it's not going to benefit them any further. So we say that at this point where we find the optimum value, which I've said is about 50 lux, um, that that is the optimum value, okay? The optimum light intensity, the best light intensity, the light intensity that's going to give us the greatest um, production of oxygen, the greatest rate of photosynthesis without it costing us lots and lots of money. Okay, and suggest so what happens later. Well, later on, it doesn't matter how much more oxygen you give, uh, sorry, how much more light you give the plant, um, no more uh, photosynthesis will take place. So that's kind of our conclusion. So we've gone right the way through this practical. We've talked about how we're going to um, collect the results. We've talked about uh, how we're going to set it up, keeping um, just the independent variable as the thing we change, we controlled all other factors. We looked at light intensity, we collected some results looking at the model. We then um, plotted our results, we used Excel, we couldn't get the line of best fit but we could um, see the pattern and we could go over this and say our line of best fit goes something like this. Uh, we do that with our bendy ruler and we've done our conclusions. We've identified independent variable, dependent variable. We've looked at the relationship. We've shown what happens later on. Um, we're going to look at one more thing, which is a model of how we could collect the data for the same experiment, but just counting those bubbles produced. OK, so I'm going to find that next. OK, this is a great model produced by the University of Reading. Just go into Google and type University of Reading Photosynthesis and you get this great model and you can change the light intensity. This time, rather than collecting the gas um, using a syringe, you can count the bubbles produced. We'll have a look at how we do that.
Okay, so here are the bubbles being produced. You've got a timer there at the top and you can just tap every time you see a bubble. So let's reset the clock. I'm gonna try and do it for 30 seconds just to show you how it works. And if you wanna play around with that, you wanna have a look on the University of Reading's uh, website and, and play with it and get your own results, then by all means go for it. So I'm gonna go on to the counter. I'm gonna go reset. And then I guess it will, oh, there it is. Right, let's go back, so. Okay, for 30 seconds, I think I got around about 91 bubbles. I'm sure you'll look at it and say, no, you didn't. Um, it's really, really difficult. Okay, and then you can go back, you can change the light intensity, and then you can have another go. So that's something that you can look at. That is one way that we could do that practical differently to how we have been doing it for this lesson. So something to look at if you're interested. Um, hope you found that useful. Hope you enjoyed the lesson. Got to do a little bit of practical in a strange sort of way. You can try it on here yourself. Uh, we've drawn some graphs and hopefully you've got quite a good understanding of how light is a limiting factor for photosynthesis. Okay, next time we're going to look at carbon dioxide and then we will finish looking at temperature. Okay, thank you. Have a good day.